angle of the hook, when you go to set that hook, the jig's going to rotate. So at the angle, it's going to drive it right up into that lip. Top speed as fast as you can crank it with the, a 15 mile an hour east wind in your face. And that's where you're going to find all these flatfish. There's all those troughs right on the edges of the sandbars. If, if people want to put themselves in that dangerous situation, let them. Don't, don't follow them. Um, if you're uncomfortable, stick to your guns. Don't, don't, don't do it. <laughs> 90% of everything in their stomach content is going to be it's going to be muscles. But these are the same ones I target like real class tarpon with when I'm on vacation. You want to put that bait on so a lot of the bait is, is stacked up on the on the shaft of the hook and a lot of that hook is exposed with the bait laying up by the shaft of the hook. Dang, you go deep when you when you're talking <laughs> rods. I love it. But if I'm going to go for big fish, I, I've learned to throw bigger plugs and, and they'll produce. I mean. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the newest stream for Fat Dad the Show. My name is Rich, the resident Fat Dad, here with my co-hosts Ed and John. How you doing, guys? Hanging in there, Rich and John. How are you? I am wonderful, gentlemen. How you doing? Pretty good. What people don't see is uh, before the stream, we're in here usually for about 20 minutes making fun of each other and i swear to god ed and john are actually brothers and they are just <laughs> they are just going at it <laughs> which is hilarious <laughs> i'm just the fat dad watching the two kids <laughs> she's time. like surprise record it and then just do like a blooper reel or something yeah real I, I, I should have done that i should have done that uh so everyone welcome to the stream uh again my name is rich we're uh we're gonna kick this off with a little bit of a different one we had two back-to-back just outstanding guests uh in a row and um i'm gonna start off with a little bit of an appeal for a little bit of assistance because the most difficult part of this once we got all the tech figured out and all that stuff um the most difficult part is finding guests that are interesting to all of you that are that are watching this um, so if you have any suggestions for people, any guests that you would like to see, I don't care who they are. You can even, I mean, you can put the name like John Skinner in there. He's not going to come on, but I was going to say, uh, Bill Dance, but you know, whatever. Yeah, you can try you, any, I will take <laughs> any and all ideas. Um, you know, anybody related to the fishing industry, saltwater, um, is what we're focusing on. Um, you know, Jim Hutchinson is a good example. We were talking more about the fishery uh, than we were about tactics for catching fish. Uh, you know, Chris was on and we were talking about the gear. So any of that, you know, email it to me, rich at fatdadfishing.com or put it in the comments here uh, or the chat here watching live. And for anyone watching the replay, just put it in the comments. And uh, that's greatly appreciated. Uh, but we're going to kick this off real quick and we're going to talk about between the three of us, we came up with a list of, um, actually it wasn't 15, but the the most important items for people to have on their kayak when they're getting set up for saltwater fishing specifically. Um, and the, the interesting thing is it, it wasn't 15, but we had so many duplicates uh, and we wanted to get 15 really good solid items. So we added a couple, a few other things in there. And I don't think we had any disagreement on them um, so we're not saying if you're new to kayak fishing, go out and buy all 15 of these things. Uh, but we're saying that you should at least be thinking about these over time. Uh, a couple of things I would recommend that you do buy immediately before you even hit the water. And we'll, we'll point that out as we go through. But uh, otherwise, we're just going to talk about all of them. And again, this is a, a participation type of event. This is a live stream for a reason. We're not just recording videos on a Sunday and putting it out there on a Monday. It's live so that we can interact with you guys. You guys give your opinions, ask any questions, all that good stuff. We're already getting some things in the chat. Uh, Elias V. Elias would be awesome to get on. Uh, I did reach out to Elias. I don't know Elias, and he didn't answer. <laughs> but uh, I think he would be great. I'm going to continue to try. Uh, Greg from Fisherman Headquarters, that would be another good guest. So I'll uh, I'll reach out to Greg, see if, uh, see if he has any interest. Um, so let's dive right in. So the, the 15... The 15 um, items or pieces of gear, however you want to phrase it, for, for kayak fishermen. And here's number one. It's going to be an obvious number one, and that's a PFD. Um, I have the one on the left, the Stolquist Fisherman, and the one on the right in this is the NRS Chinook. Uh, for anyone that wants to buy some for a woman, it's the NRS Chinook. 
instead of the Chinook. It's a catchy um, uh, name there. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty good name, actually. <laughs> uh, these are both, I've worn both. Um, I've owned the Stolquist for quite a while. And quite frankly, the or two years, uh, the only reason I bought the Stolquist is because at the early part of the pandemic, could not find a Chinook. Um, and that was the one that I was going to get. I had worn that in the past and really liked it. Uh, and I'll tell you one thing, the uh, the Fisherman, the Stolquist Fisherman is about uh, the same price. Maybe it's like 10 bucks cheaper. And it's just as comfortable. Um, I don't even notice it when I'm wearing it. And quite frankly, I love the pouches. Uh, and this is one that I would recommend you don't hit the water at all, even if you're going to be going in the flats or anything, uh, until you have this and you have it on. And feel free to disagree with me. I, I don't care. I still, I'll tell you you're wrong anyway, um, in my opinion. But to each his own. What do you guys think? Yeah, I'm going to definitely say yeah, PFD is number one. Um, I don't wear either of those. I, well, I started with this Onyx, uh, brand one. Yep. It was quite uncomfortable. Um, it was very nice, very quality made, but it just didn't fit. It didn't fit my large frame. Um, I ended up upgrading to the old town. I forget what it's called, but it is a night and day difference. Um, I don't even know I have it on. It's, it is the most comfortable, you know, PFD I've ever worn. Yeah, they, um, they have a good reputation, the old town. Yeah, I love it. If, if anything ever happened to it, I'd buy another one in a heartbeat. They are a little bit pricey. I think it was close to like 100 and 150 bucks. But, yep. you know, in your same life, price range as these two. When your life depends on it, it's, uh, you know, money well spent, I say. Yeah. John, what are you wearing? It's funny. Uh, it's the same exact way it went with Ed for me. Uh, before I even started saltwater kayak and I had a, just a paddle kayak that me and the wife bought and we bought cheap, you know, PFDs. And I think mine was an Onyx as well and large frame don't fit right. Uh, when I went, went and bought the uh, kayak that I have now, I got a discount for the uh, old town angler lure is the name of the PFD. It's the same one you have at, um, like he said, you, you can't tell that it's on. It, it's 160 bucks. But uh, like he said, I think if anything were to ever happen to that instantly, I don't think I would hesitate to spend that money. No, and, and I'll tell you, anyone that wants to go offshore, uh, well, before we get into that, so a couple of things to, to point, about, point out about these is um, they're non-inflatable. I think it's important to not have an inflatable, um, especially an auto inflate because you're going to get wet and it's going to go off on its own. Um, but you want something that's just going to make you float regardless. Uh, the second you hit the water, you're floating. You don't have to pull anything. You don't have to worry about that. As somebody who's been tangled up in lines before, the last thing you want to think about is finding uh, a pull cord. Now, again, personal choice. If you want to wear it, I, I, I'm not going to hate you for it. Um, but these are really cool because they do have a lot of pockets. And actually in the Fisherman, they fold down and it's like a hard uh, front. Um you can see it on there, the the on the one on the left, there's the really smooth uh, black, almost semicircles. When you open those up, they actually fold down and they're kind of at 90 degrees. So you can actually use them as little trays when you're in the uh, in the uh, in the boat. So you can put a lure there when you're when you're changing out. You can put your old one there so it doesn't have to drop on the on the floor of the kayak, so on and so forth. And all most all of the fishing um PFDs are going to have that. So storage is a big thing. Now, if you're going to do offshore kayak fishing, I'm going to recommend the NRS Chinook OS for offshore. That thing, I, I'm thinking about picking one up this summer. Uh, again, I went to look a few weeks ago when they were out of stock, but um, it has different, different uh, storage options, more uh, hooks and clips for offshore. So uh, one thing that people should keep in mind is these have plenty of places to clip things onto. Um, it's important when you're kayak fishing in salt water with the currents and especially offshore that you have everything you need to survive clipped to you. So if you go in the water and you get separated, it stays with you. So radio, knives, everything else um, would be clipped to you. And the OS just has a little bit of extra on there. So just want to put that out. Anything else on the PFDs before we move on to the next one? Yeah, other than <clears throat> I would not recommend an inflatable just like you. Um, you know, these, these PFDs we're talking about now, they, they float. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> so there's there's a bit of a, a safety feature there, um, you know, that I would stick with. But other than that, I'm good. Yep. 
And uh, next one, signaling devices. Now this one, it depends on what area you're in, what's, what's the law, what's not the law. Pretty much everywhere you need to have some type of an audible signaling device, like a whistle. There's two red whistles in there. Um, and keep in mind, you don't want to use the regular um, whistles that referees use because with a little cork ball in there, they don't tend to work very well when they're wet. Whereas these, um, these do work even when they're wet and they've just been submerged. So you want to get one that's specifically made for kayak fishing. You got an air horn, um, which I had for a little while. Keep in mind, even this one pictured here is made for marine uh, use. So salt water, it'll still corrode. So you got to be careful of what water that touches because you'll end up with rust rings on your kayak. And then the flags and the light poles that are attached on both the rail blazer uh, and this other one here, the uh, the, the yak, um, yak ear one, um, the visibility pole. The, the lights are 360 white lights. If you're gonna be out at night and the Coast Guard sees you without them, they will pull up to you and they will pull you over and they'll lecture you for way too long. Um, so make sure you have those it's in New Jersey. You have to have that. Thoughts? No, I mean, it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory stuff there. John, you have a, uh, you have a air horn. I have the air horn. I have the whistles. I have the yak attack visible. Yep. And, you know, instead of an orange flag, I have an American flag. So, you know, that's pretty badass. You know, so yeah, um, and I think it's important to keep in mind that um, it's not so much the color of the flag; it's the fact that you just want people to see you when you're behind swells. Uh, the the bigger the water, the the bigger the flag, or the taller the flag you actually need. Um, I've been out fishing and lost the kayak that I was fishing with between swells; they just disappear. I've actually lost boats in Absecon Inlet. They're coming in, and I'm like, oh my god, I hope they see me. Because, you know, you're in a six foot swell now, the really long period. So it wasn't bad, but they can't see me at the bottom um, with that thing only sticking up like 42 inches or something above above me. Um, but the flags and the, the safety devices are important and the Coast Guard will check. Uh, they will check you for those. And as we all know, we're fishermen. The last thing you want is Coast Guard or fishing game coming up to talk. All right, so that's that's the signaling devices. Oh, and guys, as we go through this, uh, there are links in the description of this video below if you want to see the exact ones in here, uh, any of these items. All right, John, why don't you talk about leashes? Yeah, rod leashes. Uh, I am a firm believer in these. Um, it's something that I think you should have on the kayak, just not for rods. You could also leash your paddle just in case you don't have uh, one of the items that we're going to be talking about coming up soon. Um, that way, if you say you do tip, at least you're not losing your gear. You still have a fighting chance to maybe save it. Uh, for me, and now you, Rich, and I know, Ed, you uh, now have one of my custom rods. It's it's kind of one of those investments. You don't want to lose it. So it I is kind it of over. important. Eh. Chuck it over. It'll be fine. <laughs> uh, just let me know the coordinates and I'll go find it so I can use it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ed, you're not using leashes, are you? No. 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 You're not using floats either. No, I'm going riding dirty. Yeah, you're, you're riding dirty. I, I am I am using leashes uh, on stowed rods um, that are in the back rod holders and it's clipped on not to my crate, but onto the bungees that go around the crate to hold the crate in, um, especially the expensive rods. Now I do have some cheap rods that I don't necessarily do that with. And my thought um, was validated when I actually did capsize uh, and I lost the rods. This is before I used leashes, but I never, I never dropped the one in my hand for some reason. Um, so I got back in, which was the only rod that I actually saved. I got back into the boat and I realized after climbing all the way back in that I still had the rod in my hand. I wasn't even thinking about it. So um, definitely something that's important. And I would say more importantly is uh, getting that paddle leashed um, or connected somehow to the, the kayak. Because if you go over and your, your paddle goes one way uh, and the, the kayak goes the other, you know, you got to hold on to that kayak. Um, and for a lot of us, especially fat dads, it's not easy to get back in, or I should say it's a lot easier to get back in if you have your paddle there, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. All right, so that's an easy one. 
Um, by the way, these they're linked in the description. These these on the right are the the style that I would recommend, uh, where they go around and they have like a connection. There's also some that come with a Velcro connection to put on the rod. The ones on the left, the green ones, they have those little clips. Um, th those clips, they almost like the the carabiner clips. You don't, they're not great for the rods. Now I do use those on the rods and I just clip them onto the spinning rods right onto the bale, onto the baler. Um, so it's a real quick, easy connection when it's stowed in the back. But if you wanna keep them on while you're fishing, you can't use those ones on the left. You have to get something with the Velcro strap on one end and then you can clip it on the other side, which is something on the boat. Um, so a clip on one side isn't bad, but Keep that in mind for somebody who's who's had different styles of these. You definitely want something that has a smooth, non-abrasive connection to the rod so that you're not nicking up your fingers. Ed, you you used one of my rods this fall and you're like, what the hell is this? And it's because I had to put oh, a that zip uh, tie, yeah. A zip tie. Yep. I had to put a zip tie near the reel seat so that the clip could go through there. And if it turns the right way, it gets you right between the fingers, <laughs> the sharp part of it. Um, so you don't want to have to do that. That's a legacy of the, uh, using those clip ones on, on the rods in my boat. All right. So we'll jump on to the next one here. Rod floats. I, I, I want to talk about this. So, so Ed, again, you're riding dirty. So you're, you don't have any of this stuff. <laughs> nope. John rod floats. What, what's your thought on them? Hey, again, it's another one of those things. It's protect your investment. Um, I haven't had really seen a rod float yet with a float on it i haven't tested it something maybe i should i don't have a pool i have a kitty pool i set up for the summer for myself you'll catch me drinking pina coladas in the back so maybe uh i'd rather not oh my God, that's <laughs> hilarious to think of that John I, drunk in his pool. i'd rather yeah, not i i'll have to get pictures and send that over to you guys but uh, please don't, please don't. <laughs> I will uh, probably test that theory. I want to see how all this actually works with these rod floats. It, it may work. It may not. But, hey, for I think it's like $6 for that green set. What, what, what's it hurt to try it out for 6 bucks? It's something to protect your investment. Yeah, and, and they're, they're inexpensive, as John said. Um, they connect with the Velcro. I have the ones on the bottom right. Um, so you'll see them in some of my videos on some of the rods. I don't keep them on all the rods. And the reason that I do it, and this I wanted to, this is why I put it in this order: the leashes and then the floats. You have to be very careful when you're using leashes on a kayak, um, especially I think in salt water or in rivers because you have a lot of current. And if you go over and those rods go out of the holders, um, they're now connected to the boat, which means you're you're going to get wrapped up uh, in those things, or you can get wrapped up, which is a great argument for rod floats. So if it goes over, let the rods float away. It doesn't matter because as soon as you rescue, you're going to see this, this orange, this green, this yellow floating around. You'll see the rod. And then you can go over and you can pick it up at your leisure rather than having them all lashed to you and perhaps inhibiting your ability to get back into the kayak. Um, so that's, really, that's a really important consideration. Now, I'm not saying don't use the leashes. Like I said, I use them. Um, I also, when I went over in the Raritan, I got tangled in line. Now, it was a line that was out uh, from one of the rods that I was trolling, but it's the same principle. When I went over, I went over top of the line. The line went around me, and I had 30-pound braid wrapped multiple times around both legs, which meant you can't kick, which is a great argument for having a life vest on because I couldn't kick to keep myself floating. So I had to, uh, I had to cut all the braid, which then release the rod to fall to the bottom of the raritan um now with that said i do have those like i mentioned i have i do not have a pool i don't have a kiddie pool either um <laughs> and i am unwilling to test my uh my saltwater gear in salt water so i guess i could go down to a river and i don't know i'm lazy i, I just don't feel like going to a river and throwing my gear in um, but I do have them on a couple of rods. I have seen videos of them working and working on something around the size of a three to 4,000 uh, reel. Now, a newer reel. I'm not talking these all metal old pens. I'm talking about, you know, like a, uh, a Daiwa um, Fuego weight, you know, so like eight ounces plus the rod. So it's about 12 ounces. And it, they were floating. They were fine. Um, at least they were butt up 
uh, sticking out of the water and easy to see, but I can't personally validate validate that. I can just say I use them, and uh, that's about as far as I can go. And Ed will continue to not use them until he loses rod. I've just I've just absolved myself to the fact that it's if it's going to get lost, it's going to get lost. <laughs> yeah. So Bill Bill day. is saying in the in the chat he watched a video where a guy tested it in the pool. I saw that same one. I think um, the older gentleman was doing. He was just tossing rods in. Um, now he those were freshwater rods. If it's the same video that I was that I had seen, and I think there were actually the ones on the bottom right, which I think is why I bought them. Uh, but they were bass rods, which were fairly close to flounder rods. Uh, I wouldn't be sticking a tuna rod or an offshore rod with just one of the floats. If you're going to use floats, I'd go, you know, double up um, or Jeez, triple up. Not, I mean, you're not trolling doormats with a international 50 wide two speed. No, no, I do have an only you John. over here. I do have a 50 over there, I think. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was telling everybody. You can almost see the rods back. I got a couple of tuna rods back there. I don't even know why they're out of storage because um, I certainly don't see any chance of going out for tuna in the kayak this year. All right, so that covers the rod floats. Um, and John, did you buy the, the green ones? Yeah, yeah, those yeah. are the ones I have. So, okay, so maybe this summer, if either of us go over, <laughs> we'll be able to tell you which ones work and which ones don't. I am not planning to go over in the summer. Uh, yeah. but there is a lake down the street from work. So maybe I'll just stop by this week. We got some nice weather throw something in. There you go. There you go. If you want to wait till it warms up? I'll just chuck a few in my pool. We can do it yeah. on a live stream too. Oh, there you go. See, John's going to throw it out this weekend. It's just going to hit the ice and just sit there. <laughs> well, floats. Yeah. Doesn't sink. <laughs> All right. Water shoes. John has strong opinions about this. Ed, what about water shoes? I, I think they're awesome um i found these ones on amazon they were like 20 bucks i don't know if they're gonna last next season but um super lightweight uh they have like a rubber it's just basically a flip-flop that just covers your whole foot really um they just keep you from getting into nasty stuff um they kind of protect your feet too from the sun because i don't know about you but i don't like sunburn on my feet um for the for the money you invest in them it was worth every penny i mean I don't have like Merrill money like on the on the right there, but you know Amazon's got some options, pretty uh, reasonably priced. They do, and I didn't put those options because I haven't used them personally. Um, and now I, I have no Merrill in the past. Um, that that's about eighty five ninety dollars on the right, and that one on the left I put because it's Crocs, and Crocs are damn near indestructible for the regular Crocs. So I figured these probably are as well. Um, but they're, they're much less expensive. But when I actually use water shoes, I just use like 10 to $15 ones. They last one season. And the reason that I use them is because, uh, there, there are hooks, uh, where I launch quite often. Um, and quite often there are a lot of rocks and a lot of, uh, sharp edges, slippery edges, and, and it does help with the traction. It does help, you know, you can jump right out and not worry about, uh, about killing your foot. John, I would think that you would appreciate this, even though John is not a fan of these water shoes, for the one place that we launch um, near Karen's house. Uh, there's <laughs> definitely a lot of rocks there. That is a vicious place to, to launch, if you ask me. Hey, listen, man, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. If I get a cut in my foot, hey, gangrene green, it gets cut off, whatever. No. Keep going. <laughs> well, it, it's it's tough. It's tough for you to uh, use a pedal without without a foot. It makes it a little Rich, bit more difficult. Bill has a question for you. <laughs> what do you wear if you have a dry suit on? Okay, so this is actually pretty funny. I actually wear sandals over top of my dry suit. <laughs> it's funny as hell. <laughs> it looks ridiculous. I have a pair of like, um, I don't know, they're like $30 reef sandals. They're probably like 15 years old at this point. Actually, you see them in my videos. I wear sandals instead of water shoes. Um, I don't your, worry your about burning the top of my feet. Your um, shoe bees coming out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my shoe bees coming out. Um, I literally, because I just put them right over top of the dry suit. It looks ridiculous. I will also, um, I did have a couple of pairs of just old um, Adidas running shoes that I got. Uh, they weren't old. I mean, they're old now. Uh, I got them specifically to wear over a dry suit. So I got them a size and a half too big. Um, 
and those worked those worked fine as well. The only problem with that is if you're going to wear regular sneakers in salt water, they're going to stink. So um, mm-hmm. I, I decided that I was not going to go that route anymore. They became lawn mowing shoes for about a half a season. I couldn't stand the smell of myself, so I threw them out. Um, so you definitely want something, even with a dry suit, that's going to shed the water like the water shoes will. Um, and just remember, wearing a dry suit, putting something on your feet, you want to go two, probably two sizes bigger because it's a dry suit. It's not insulated. You're going to want thick socks. Um, so it's like wearing two or three pairs of socks. So that's why I use the sandals. They're fully adjustable. And it looks stupid, but I'm fishing and the people that are laughing at me aren't. So... No, I was fishing right next to you. Yeah, well, you didn't laugh in my face. Now I know. <laughs> Actually, I think I asked you. So what the hell's on your feet? I know you did. <laughs> hey, it worked. It worked. It got out on the water safely. And and the the big thing with the dry suit is you have to have something that has a good sole um, because you definitely don't want to get out of the water in a dry suit and cut that dry suit on something. Uh, you got to protect that because that's expensive to repair. It's expensive to buy them. So. That's what I do. Water shoes work. Bump boards, Ed. Yes, they are very important. Um, it's just, it makes life easy. Um, I tried to measure a flopping fish on the deck of my kayak with a tape measure, and it wasn't fun. Um, my wife and kids got me a, the yak gear for Christmas, so I'm excited to use that. I found one uh, that kind of worked. It's a little flimsy. Um Dick sells it. It's a Rapala one. It, it works. Um, but yep. these Yak Gear ones are um, – and then the – was that the Catch, I think, at the bottom? No, it's actually the Hobie. I just put the things that were on Amazon. Catch is not on Amazon. Okay. Um, catch board, so, so <clears throat> one thing, that Yak Gear floats. I believe that it's the Hobie Hog Trough. I believe that floats – or no, I don't believe that floats. It comes with a tether. Um, Keep in mind with the yak gear, which is what I also use, what Ed is, has in his hands right now, um, that, that is a very odd material that it's made out of, and you can break it. And I mine is broken at this point. It is uh, cracked, so I can still use it, but it has a crack in it. Um, so you got to be careful with them. You don't want to just toss them around, but it also folds up to go under your seat, which is awesome. It just, it's, it's, I, I absolutely love it. Even though I cracked mine, I am absolutely going to uh, get another one um, and continue using it mainly because it floats. It's one less tether that you have to worry about. One less thing that's going to hit the bottom. It's uh, big but, too. It goes like 35 inches. This one. Yep. 35 inches. Now I will say this, if you're going to fish most tournaments and you're going to, and you're serious into tournaments, get a catch. Um, which again is not in the description. It's not in the pictures here. It does look like the Hobie, the Hobie hog trough at the bottom. Um, but that is tournament certified for 99% of the tournaments. Whereas that yak gear <coughs> is not. And the big reason is it's foldable, which means that it could be off by even, you know, a 10th of an inch is too much for these tournaments. So just keep that in mind. If you're tournament fishing and you have to do an on the water measure, and send that picture in, they won't necessarily accept that yak gear. Now, I will say that the Fisherman Magazine does. They do accept the yak gear for their uh, their summer tournaments, like the, uh, the the kayak one that they did last summer. They did accept the yak gear. Um, they did accept any commercial uh, measuring boards. That yak gear, I do believe, is approved by the one of the bass associations, though. Okay. One of the bigger ones. So it might be that they're getting better now than they used to be. So, you know, it might not be as flimsy or, you know, that tenth of an inch that you're talking about. They may have corrected those issues. So, yeah. And it's not that it's flimsy. It's, Ed, I mean. Um... It, it's stiff. It, don't get me wrong. It's stiff. But I think it's it's the locking point that they're more concerned right. about. So. Right. It's yeah, but it's just odd material, though. It's not like a regular plastic. It's it's it's, it's a weird glass. It's like glass fiber reinforced plastic. Yeah, I uh, mean, I like it. It's it's light. It floats, um, which is why it's that weird material. Uh, but yeah, you definitely want a, a bump board. Nothing worse than measuring a. So you know, personal experience, I can tell you, I have a measuring tape, and I'm trying to measure a flounder that's coming in at 18. And then I'm like, before I put it on the stringer, let me check one more time. 
and it's 18 and a quarter. Oh, I'm good. I'm about to put it on the string. I'm like one more time. It's 17 and three quarters. It's like, God. And then you start all you over know, again. <laughs> you got to keep starting over because the last thing you want to do, well, and me, <laughs> last thing I want to do is after doing videos is get busted, you know, breaking the law. So for the longest time, I wouldn't even consider keeping anything that was under 18 and three quarters um, or 19 just because, I, you know, it's so hard on a moving kayak. So bump board just makes it that much easier. Um, and you don't have, to, you know, a lot of people use those rail measures. Yeah, hold a flounder on the rail and see what happens. That it'll just fly right out of your hand, right overboard. Sometimes it does it on the bump board, is one of my videos showed. But I was um, going to say, in my first uh, video appearance, that happened in that video to you. And yeah. that, was a, that was a nice size fish, too. I think it was like 22, 23 inches. I, I don't know if it was that big. It was a keeper. I don't remember. All I remember is that it was a keeper, um, and it got away. Um, was that the one that jumped out of your lap? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right over the fish finder, which is not I, easy with that visor I have on it. I lost a keeper tog this year to, to that. I, I didn't have anything with me to measure other than my, my kayak paddle. So I leaned over cause it was clipped to the side and I held the fish up against it and it flopped right out of my hand gone. You didn't have the fish grips on it. No, I don't put fish grips on it. I don't even I use don't, them things. You know what? I think that's one thing we need to put on the list now here. thinking about it. Yeah. I was going to say at the end, we'll just add a few things. Um, you definitely want fish grips if you're saltwater, unlike Ed, because you catch a blue fish. Um, you don't want it thrashing around in your lap. If you catch a shark, um, a smaller brown shark, it's it's much easier to control the head with good grip in its mouth. Um, I personally, I just you know I just grab them if they're under four and a half feet. Uh, but you know, don't go grabbing a shark until you know how strong they are, because uh, if you've never grabbed one, they're a lot stronger than you, uh, even oh, the yeah. small ones. And they will turn on you and they will come all the way back and bite you if you don't really know how to control them. But I just always advise, um, you know, if someone's putting together the kayak for the first time. They haven't been at water level with uh, toothy fish. It's really nice to uh, not have to pull something with big teeth into your lap. It's nice to be able to hold their head up and then pull it into the boat. You know, striper doesn't matter. Just pull it right in. It's not going to do anything. But bluefish, that can, that can ruin your day and your weekend. <laughs> so. I, I was going to say, there's actually a lot of fish out there. And if people don't know, and that's fine. But, you know, do your homework before you go out there, too. Don't go start lipping fish. Yeah. Uh, I, I witnessed it at the morning at Lighthouse. Uh, a woman, she didn't really speak English. And... We kept yelling no, and she, yeah, guess what? Her thumb got torn up by a bluefish we gave her. Yeah, yeah. I saw a guy with a speckled trout. It was hilarious. <laughs> How do you miss those fangs? How do you miss those fangs? And he he knew as soon as he did it, he's like, what am I thinking? But it had already uh, put two holes in his thumb. So. Uh, that's hilarious. You can, you can lip a weak fish. You just got to go on the side. Yeah, this guy didn't. He, he went straight down the middle. Listen, um, I'm not chancing it. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's go on to the next one. So it's funny that James is asking in the chat, does Ed have anything on his kayak? Well, here's another thing Ed does not have. Because <laughs> I don't go out of cell range. Yeah, emergency VHF radio. Um, and I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i say this. If, if anyone wants to go fishing with me, it is so much easier if you just have one of these. It's just easier. If you're going to go offshore... I mean, I go with people that don't have them. That and I haven't gone offshore yet. Uh, but man, I have it, no desire to go offshore, to be honest. Yeah, I'll tell you what, it stresses me out uh, being out in the Raritan and being with people that don't have these radios. And the simple reason, and by the way, these two up here, um, I own the the Uniden on the left. Uh, the Cobra on the right is also a very good one. The difference between the two is the Uniden does not float uh, and the Cobra does. Um I went with, I used to have a floating one back in the day. Um, and the problem is when you go in the water and it's tethered to your life jacket, it ends up knocking into your face the whole time because it's floating. Um, so I went with a non-floating one that's always tethered to me with the unit in. And that's that's what I have right now. But here, here's the here's the big case for an emergency VHF. So, so Ed, you're saying you stay in cell range, which is good. Um, but you have a smartphone, and the second that screen gets wet, even if it's in a waterproof uh, bag, it's not necessarily going to allow you to dial because once it's wet, um, it senses the water as a finger, so it just kind of freezes the screen. 
Um, so it, it'll you say, you hey, can Siri. Get it. what's that? When you say, hey, Siri. Well, you can do that. You can if you can hear it. <laughs> You know, if, if they can hear you and you can hear it, you can. But um, no, you're I, right. I, would, I mean, I would I'm, definitely recommend I'm, an it emergency is on the list VHF. It also makes it a lot easier mm -hmm. when you're out there on the water with other people. John and I are always talking on on the radio um, and I don't have to keep pulling out the, the phone to keep texting back and forth. Um, the only time I think that we would text is if it was a tournament. We didn't want people to hear what we were doing. That's and, uh one of my channels that I told you about that you go, why the hell are you even on this channel? That's your answer. Cause no one uses it when it comes to yeah. tournament time. We'll, we'll revisit that. We'll, yeah. we'll talk about that. So, yeah. So it's, it's nice. These radios for those that are not aware, you see it's on channel 16 on both of these images. Uh, it's one button, usually a red button. You hit that and it goes to 16. That's your emergency frequency to the coast guard. If you ever get really bored, just listen to that channel and all these idiots that try to talk on it. The Coast Guard gets really mad really quick. Uh, they tell them to get off the channel. So, uh, But that's also where you hear of any things that are going on in your area. Uh, if you see something happening, you can uh, radio for help for somebody using Channel 16 or just monitor what's going on if you see helicopters flying over you like we did this past fall um, at Obsequian Inlet. Um, yeah. So definitely going to recommend a VHF radio. Um, yeah. John, you have one. I got, well, we have the second kayak coming yep. March 18th. It's being shipped, so we're, we're on track. Uh, but no, this one, I was actually, that's why you see me walking around and looking at the screen all funny. I was trying to figure out if this was the same unit in the picture. I uh, picked up the 155 just so I have something, you know, for whoever's out with me. Uh, right. The other one I have is the Standard Horizon. Yeah, another I, great, great radios by Standard Horizon. I can't remember the exact number on it, um, but it, it's absolutely awesome. I think I paid 95 bucks for it. It's got like a 15-mile range. Lasts all day. It has built-in AM, FM radio. Uh, the biggest thing about these radios, too, and you want to keep in mind and look at it, is it IPX7 rated. That, that In case you go over, you got to make sure that it can take on some water real quick. Um if it does go over, make sure it can float. That's another big thing. And the one feature that I like about my standard horizon is if it falls off of me, the L uh, LCD screen on the back will flash and strobe. In case it's a little darker out, I'll be able to find it in the water. So those are some features that you may want to take into consideration when looking at these radios. Yep. And I think that the most important feature, Ed, listen up to this one, is just get one. Just got one. I just said it was on the list, but you talked over me. <laughs> Sorry. When's your birthday? Maybe me and Rich will both pitch in on that. I'm not telling you. He's going to say tomorrow. And that's fine. All right, let's go on to crates. I have a crate, but John has pre-bought crates. I have one, too. Yep. Yes. Uh, so here's something that's on Ed's kayak, James. Oh, yeah, James. I have, I have the uh, flambeau, the one on the, uh, the left. I love it. That's it. John, what do you got? Oh, yeah. I got the uh, nice Yak Attack Black Pack. It's really fancy. Just cool it, name. Hey, it's got a cool orange sticker. So, no, I like it. it. That's To me, that's probably one of the better boxes out there. I mean, hey, you're paying for the name, but I absolutely love it. Now, for the other kayak, I just bought one of those $6 Sterlite great laundry basket looking things and put two dollar rod holders on it yeah so well, there the, the options the, are endless with this yeah the flambeau so, crate comes with rod holders you just have to screw them to the side of it, it comes with four. yeah and that's the same thing with the yak attack one yeah so there the, these are both the the most popular out of the box you know just buy it don't make it um boxes um i think the big difference is you have the upper tray on the uh the tough crate on the left um, the, the knock on that is, has really, as far as I've seen, only been those clasps, um, can break that keep it shut. Um, ain't broken but, yet. but no, uh, I, I haven't seen one. I've just seen people say that, uh, but normal kayak fishermen just put a bungee over top anyway. So, you know, you, you just put a bungee over it and it's, and it's fine. The black, the, the yak attack black pack 
is uh, for the person that really wants to put stickers. So if you love stickers, it is made for you. It is black, so everything will stand out and look at all that smooth side on there. You can see it does have holes for mounting uh, accessories to the side and more rod holders. Um, and you know the biggest knock on the the Yak Attack is that it's just expensive. It's mm -hmm. it's a pretty expensive thing. And then on on my end, I decided I wanted to make my own. Um, I don't have a picture of it here, but I just bought a a, a couple of uh, twenty dollar crates. I got a black one, and then I cut the bottom off an orange one. I cut some some uh, angles on it so that the top flips up and stays vertical. I put some rod holders on the back. I love it. Um, I just have fun doing those types of things. So you know, I could certainly get one of these. I almost bought uh, one of each, and um, I figured one I would use for offshore and one I would use for inshore uh, because I rarely do both in one day. Uh, but I just I had so much fun making one that I made another one. <laughs> so it was more like what I really like. So I'm just going to stick with the do it yourself. So I'll probably do a video on how to make that. It's real easy, real quick, real simple. Um, as a matter of fact, I walked a couple of people through it by a text and it came out literally exactly like mine. So it's, it's really simple. Uh, but crates are important because you can put stuff in there. You can seal it so that the stuff doesn't dump. If you go over, um, it offers some protection, um, from the sun. Um, you know, and it's good. It's a really good spot to stow your rods. You know, the rod holders on the sides of kayaks are only good enough for a couple of things. You, you don't want rods sitting there all day just going to get in the way yeah it keeps them up and vertical i will say this though if you go with the flambeau crate you do need an engineering degree to put the damn thing together uh, oh, yeah. it, it, comes, it comes like flat pack so <laughs> you have to put everything together that was fun uh, yeah, uh, it's the same thing with the yak attack one you have to put it together but it's i'm hope, i guess it's not to the degree what you're saying no nah, this is it's all like fishing the, the the flambeau one, it that's the that's the only downside to it. It's like these little fingers that lock into each other, but if you don't line it up right, it'll snap together. But then you'll have like, it's like a, like a common core house or something. Like, it'll be crooked as all hell. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what though, it is it is kayak fishing, and people love to mod things up. So you get a little oh, bit of that mods. in building these. Yeah. <clears throat> I've done I've done some mods to mine. Like I have. Uh, I did tethers for the lids so they don't because yep. it'll flip all the way back. Um, so I've I made tethers and stuff so the lids only go up to like 90 degrees. I mean, there's you can still mod all kinds of stuff. There's uh, guys are putting the um, uh, the liners that you get that um, yeah, the foam foam liner stuff or like yoga mat material. They line the inside of them so they don't rattle. I mean, there's all yep. kinds of stuff you can do. Yeah, Dude, people use it to put their live wells in. Mm -hmm. all right on to the next one i'm gonna hit this one so knives and i'm not talking about fillet knives um this is something that you should have that you can tether to your pfd again i got tangled in 30 pound braid which is not easy to break with your hands um, let alone when you have multiple wraps going around you so you want to have something quick in case of an emergency um you, you might have to um, get off of a snag you might have an anchor get tied up on something where you need to do a quick cut um, or you just might need to have something handy just for a fish or something like that. And it's always good to have a knife attached to you sheathed. Obviously both of these have sheaths. Uh, the one at the top is an NRS. I think it's called an NRS pilot. Again, it's linked down in the description. And then the one on the right is a scuba, um, dive knife. Um, you notice that it does not have the point on it because it's not necessary for what you're going to be using it for. Uh, but those are really important to have tethered to you with, with full disclosure. I don't have one tethered to me right now. I did. Um, and quite frankly, I lost it. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere near me within 20 feet and I have no idea where it is. So I got to get another knife. You guys carrying knives on your PFD? Not on my person no. Yeah, I carry the, uh, probably like the most inappropriate knife, the Smith and Wesson M and P special ops, high carbon stainless steel, full tank, big, uh, Fixed blade survival knife. Yeah. Yes, I just looked at Amazon on that one. Yeah. Um, no, it's to me that's it's it's important. Like you said, you get tangled, you have something there. I I want something a little bit stronger that I have a little bit of reinsurance. Like if I have that anchor tied up or something, and it's not going the right way, and something starts to go south, cut that immediately. I 
hey, look, my life's more important than a $20 setup on Anchor. You know? Yeah, and, and keep in mind the importance of what we're talking about. It's a different type of knife, right? So you want something that's a fixed blade and sheathed because if you if you need it in an emergency, all you want to do is pull it and have it there at the ready. So these are small knives. They're probably only four inches long. Um, I think they're both under four inches long, actually. Um, they literally fit in your hand. Uh, so it's, it's just a pull from the sheath, and then it's right there, and then you can cut whatever you need to cut. Um, and they're not incredibly expensive. I think they're both less than fifty dollars. Um, but you know, it's something. Again, I don't have it, but I think everybody should. All right, Ed, you can talk about this because I know you love yours and I love mine. Same brand. Oh uh, yeah, the boomerang. That thing. <clears throat> I was at a, um, uh, my local bait shop, FC Can Bay, and I was checking out, and he's got them like conveniently placed right at the register. So you know, a little tchotchke. It was like 10 bucks and i'll tell you what that was the best ten dollars i ever spent the thing is sharp it stays it's small i mean it's probably it's like this big it's it stays right on my shirt on my shoulder uh, you know if i ever lost it i'd buy 10 more to replace it i can't say enough good about that thing john do you have one of these uh this is actually one thing i do not carry okay well you I'm have a diver and you don't carry a, a, a line cutter yeah, I know. He's got that big knife that he needs to he needs to use. Look, I, if I if I see a ten point buck out there, I'm jumping out of the kayak. I'm taking that buck down. You can't yeah. run that fast. I'm I, I, you'd be surprised. I'm quick for a fat guy. <laughs> so I use the boomerang. That's what I use to cut that braid off of me. Um, it's retractable and it's got a pretty long reach. It's longer than than my arm length. So. I was able to kind of reach down and cut it off of my legs with no problem. Just let go. And it just shot right back up uh, to my shoulder. I've used it for two years and the retract still works. Um, although sometimes it, it, it comes up shy by about uh, half an inch to three quarters of an inch. So I'm going to have to get another one this year, but they're only like 10 bucks, I think, or yeah. probably even less. It was uh, but, like to 10 or $12. But yeah. And, and, and I don't do that, so I should. I don't actually clean my my PFD or anything that's on it, with the exception of the radio. Um, so it's been in salt water and not rinsed in two years. Uh, actually, I've rin I have rinsed after um, last. No, it hasn't been rinsed in a, in a year. So um, except for rainstorms, so it it held up. There's nothing rusting on it. It's still incredibly sharp. It's great for braid. Um, unlike, you know, people trying to use knives or regular scissors, it's a good braid cutter, uh, just an easy, quick thing to get. And it will change your life out there. If you're not flipping around knives and you can just do a real quick cut, uh, with one of these, with one of these line cutters, be interested to hear, um, if anybody in the, in the stream right now watching is using these. And if there's any other brand that you would recommend, cause I'm going to pick up a new one this year. So I had the Rapala one here, which I've never used. I use the Boomerang and love it, but be interested to see if anyone else is using different brands. It looks like James Flynn says they're great. Hopefully you let us know what he's using. Um, one thing I could say is I, I know that me and you follow one of the same guys, uh, Rich, on Facebook. Um, I think one of his sponsors is Line Cutters, and I've heard yeah. really great things about theirs. So I, I've been actually looking at it. I've been meaning to order one. Maybe I'll give that a go. And, right, James uh, is using the boomerang too. Okay. First aid kit. All right. I'm going to throw this out there and say I have at various times of the year, different versions of this. Um, but I almost always have a pretty good, no, I'm not saying get this one. This is hilarious. This is, this is marketed as a kayak and boat bag. If I'm correct, isn't this a saw? <laughs> Where one, of those little, one of those little saws right next to the oh, bag. Yeah. Yeah. A rope saw. Be. A little rope saw. <laughs> so I don't so, know. I but mean, you might have to sever off the limb completely. I, I don't know. Yeah. We're not doing amputations out there. I don't care what happens. That gangrene on your foot there, John. We're not cutting <laughs> anything off. Um, but it is important um, when you're out on the water, uh, you know, when things go bad, they go bad fast and, and they go bad worse than they, they would on dry land. 
So having something to stop bleeding, um, quick clot is a big thing to have. Now you're going to have knives and, and everything, but having something that you can wash a wound. Um, if you haven't been been hit by a, a fin uh, cut on a, a spine, if you haven't hit uh, the tooth of a bluefish, if you have, I mean, I know the three of us, all three of us have had cuts out on the water in the past year. Cause I, Ed, you had a really good one, didn't you? Um, no, not this year. No. Who was it? Somebody had one out on the boat. I forget. We were out. Oh, yeah. We were out on the party boat. That's what it was. Uh, I think it was Jack. It was Jack. Jack yeah. had a really nice, uh, really nice cut on his hand. I don't um, remember how he did it, but. And, and luckily they had, I think it was with the knife or the cutters. Um, yeah, yeah, it was uh, my awesome knife. That's yeah, right. yeah. So John's knife almost killed a guy. Yeah, uh, but but being on a on a charter boat, you know, they have the 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 medical kits. But here's the way I look at it: get it. These things only cost thirty, forty dollars. They come with those waterproof bags. Um, just throw it in the kayak, and um, I look at it this way: it's probably most likely, in my mind, going to be for somebody else. But it's a good feeling to know that you had something to help somebody out out on the water. And it can be the difference between heading back in uh, and staying out for the day. A good, a good example is you bury a hook in your finger, right? Um, a lot of people go to the hospital. Well, you don't have to. You can actually get hooks out on your own. It hurts a little bit, but you can get them out. But you got to put something on it to stop the bleeding. Um, and, and not so much the bleeding. I mean, it'll stop. But uh, once you pull a hook out, you need to get something on there so you don't get infected, especially out on the water. So... This just means you can fish for the rest of the day and, and you can look all over YouTube and it's usually fishing guides. You're like, Oh, they got a the big hook in their hand. They tell the other guy how to help them get it out. They get it out and they're fishing two minutes later with just a, a bandage on their hand. Um, and sometimes a rubber glove over top. I've seen a lot of people like their thumb, they rip off a, a, a nitrile glove um, thumb and they put it, their thumb in it, then they cut it off. So it's only the thumb and then they just bandage it up. So, nothing can get in there it's still waterproof and everything but it can make the big difference in a day so i recommend just getting a first aid kit i'm going to going to guess that you guys don't have full kits you just have small accessories no i got a full kit full kit okay yeah. no i just carry a small uh couple of things uh, but i have a full trauma kit i i fat kit in my truck so yeah i'm not we're never that far away to where we can't get there you know in a reasonable amount of time so right that's just you haven't fished with us in uh, those further spots yet. I used to go fishing with my brother. If that's the case, because I have like chest seals. Like I, I'm prepared for all kinds of craziness. So, um, yeah. So yeah, my brother had a staple gun. He was just like, oh, we'll just staple that. Don't go to the hospital. <laughs> let me staple it. Like, oh, I don't want my little brother stapling anything. Uh, all right, so that's the first aid kit, important to get. Um, rescue ladder. John, why don't you talk about these? I don't have one, um, but I've seen them work, um, and the concept is outstanding. All right, so the whole thought process is I, I haven't gone over yet, but if I'm out there by myself and I'm struggling to get back in that kayak, I know I have a ladder on board which is great because if you could see the one on the right-hand side, which is the one I have, it's called the C-Sense. It's $30 on Amazon. It folds up and it's easy to stow away. Um, you take that and open it up all the way. You tie that off to a cleat that floats. And the best way to get back into a kayak is actually go into it horizontally as opposed to vertically because all you're going to do is tip that kayak back over again. That thing lays in the water horizontally, go with the ladder, and just kind of belly flop yourself back into the kayak. Um, to me, it's it's good because you could be fishing with someone that's older or someone that doesn't have the mobility like myself because I'm fat. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's a good thing to have, in my opinion. It's gonna, I think it's a, a life saving situation, honestly. Yeah, it it can certainly be, um, especially if you have some really rough waters. And, and everybody keep in mind. So first of all, everybody should be practicing re-entry, uh, self-rescue into their kayak. When it's hot out, just before you head out for the day or at the very end of the day, after you unload everything, just go back out and dump the, the kayak. Just tip it over. 
and practice getting back in. Uh, practice getting in with your PFD on, all the stuff you'd normally have on you, but just empty the kayak so you don't lose anything. And John's absolutely right. A vertical reentry is just disaster. You you want to come in, you know, you want to come in this way. Your feet are behind you and you don't pull yourself up and into the kayak. You're essentially just pulling the kayak under you. Um, and I know it sounds like the same thing, but it's not. If you th really think about it, you pull the kayak under you. You do not pull yourself onto the kayak. Um, and the ladder just makes that so much easier. I mean, all that power in your legs, it's not even close. One leg has like exponentially more power in it um, than one, than both arms. So um, you definitely want to do that. Then just think about it. You can squat, you know, in, in my peak, I was squatting well over 400 pounds and I was, you know, I couldn't curl anywhere near that with two arms. I mean, not even a quarter of that. So um just keep that stuff in mind uh, when when you're uh, when you're thinking about these these things. Ed, you don't have one. I don't have one. I think it's a no. good idea, um, and it kind of goes into the next one. I have used this. Uh, this is what I used in the Raritan, and this is where it goes back to John's earlier point about tethering that that paddle to the the kayak. So when you're a bigger guy, it's not easy to get your 200 plus 250 plus uh frame back up into these kayaks especially when the water is you know you know you're going up and down and the waves come and all of a sudden the kayaks above you and then it's a little below you well with the paddle float if you have your paddle all you do is you lay it across the kayak and you put the paddle float on the end and you just blow it up it's like a balloon only it's really quick to blow up and these have dual chambers the river stone on the right the wiseman on the left so you blow up both halves of it it's secured to the paddle and you just keep that side out and you just literally climb on top of your paddle and the paddle will be held up on one side by the kayak and the float on the other. And you literally just slide right up the, the paddle and right into the kayak. It is so easy. It's ridiculous. Um, practice it once and you're never going to feel like you ever have to practice it again. I'd still recommend doing it every year, but um, yeah, it, it was, I mean, I was out in that water and it was, I was back in in no time because, you know, the longest part was blowing it up. Um, and I keep this under my seat. The Old Town Big Water has a little pouch, a mesh pouch underneath the seat. And I keep it on the side that I would re-enter from, which is the right side. It just rolls up and I just keep it tucked in there. So if I go over, I get to the right hand side. I literally reach up a foot from my face grab the thing, put it in the paddle. Um, and then I'm back in probably takes about two, three minutes in total. Uh, John, you have one of these, right? Yes. Yeah. I and think Ed, I have the uh, NRS one. You got the NRS. Yeah. So yeah. this is one of those, there's a lot of different brands. Um, I can tell you that, that the, uh, that they all pretty much work. I would suggest getting one with the dual chamber um, just in case uh, one goes, you still have another. Um, but yeah, they're, they're good. Ed, do you have one of these yet? No. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to suggest that... Um, I have a floating paddle, but not, not a paddle float. <laughs> yeah, if, if anyone's not really practiced its self-entry or self-rescue uh, while in the water, it, and the important thing is water over your head. Um, if the water is over your head and you can't get in where you haven't practiced getting in, just get one of these. They're like 15, 20 bucks. The really good ones like the NRS, I think a 35. Um you know, and they'll last, and I can tell you they work. They work for my fat butt, um, and it was really easy, really easy. So definitely recommend picking up paddle float. Got a couple more here, dry bags. This should be self-explanatory. Uh, you go over. That bag has an extra set of clothes in it, your cell phone, wallet, whatever. Hey, guess what? It's dry. I got new clothes for the ride home, so I'm not soaking, especially someone like you that has a two-hour drive. Yeah, and I actually keep uh, all of my camera gear in there. Um, so it's a couple of reasons. Uh, it's it's totally waterproof, and when you roll it up, as you can see with the blue bag there, it's easy to see. It traps all the air in there, so if I go over, that thing's just going to float, and it's going to be like a beacon. Um, so it's going to be easy to find. All my gear is going to be fine. Um, I actually don't even, I, I, you know, I do, I tether that to the back of my seat. 
So I just turn around and grab it off of the top of the crate, grab the batteries I need or whatever I want out of there. Um, don't keep your food in there. Don't keep water in there. Um, it's not for food. It'll get hot. It'll get really hot in the summer. It'll get really warm in the fall. Um, it just picks up that heat. It just cooks everything in there. So made that mistake once with a, a, a granola bar. <laughs> hey, hey, Rich, uh, let me ask this question real quick here. Yeah. Hey, you got one of these on the boat? <laughs> no. See, Old Town has this cool feature. It's got a dry box built into the pedal drive. So uh, whatever I need that keep, I don't, I mean, I don't really bring anything that can't get wet. So. Right. He still hasn't fished with this long enough yet. He hasn't learned. I don't, yeah, I, I don't need to bring my whole life on the kayak with me. Just what I need yeah. to go fishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I throw my keys in that dry hatch um, and the dry hatch is for the most part dry. I have heard of water getting in, uh, but I don't really care about my keys. If they get wet, they get wet. Um, it's more of a security thing there, but I've never had water get in that dry hatch on the, the big water. I, I have heard people that have though. So you got to, I, I think the mind. seal's starting to go on mine a little bit. So I'll be using the dry bag a little bit more. Yeah. So. Yeah. Now, one good thing about this, you can see right under the D, that little bag there, almost all of these come with a cell phone uh, sleeve or bag with a little tether on it. Th they all work, but I look at them as disposable. I get through like two or three a season because they just kind of come apart. They're, they're not really well made, but they do work. I have on top of that, I do have a waterproof phone. So um, if mine gets wet, it's not a big deal. I just don't like it to get wet because it's salt water. Um, so I try to keep that off of it. Um, plus, I don't have a tether on my phone, so I kind of use that for the tether. Um, you'll see, if you see my life jacket, you'll see extra tethers uh, hanging off of it where I'll double or triple tether depending on the weather. Um, if I think it, it's possible that I go in the water, all those extra tethers that are kind of hanging off the, the chest uh, will be tied onto the phone. <laughs> so. He just a little up. extra security there. And, 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 you know, I did lose a phone uh, mm -hmm. overboard. So, you know, I have that $800 mistake already in my pocket. So I don't want to have that happen again. If you're fishing behind Brigantine, um, just look for an Android back there. It might be mine. She's gone. She's gone. And it was at night. So as soon as it hit the water, that screen lit up. And I just saw it just slowly disappear down into the depths. <laughs> You know, the exact dock it's off of, too, but it's dead. All right, last one. And then we'll throw a couple of extras in there that we didn't mention, but sun protection. Ed? Yeah. That's yeah, you. I know that guy. Um, see, look, there is stuff on my kayak. Yep. Um, <laughs> no, sun protection is a big one for me. Um, I uh, I had a little bit of a scare over the, well, I guess, in the starting into the fall. Um, I had to have some, some spots removed and not fun. Um, luckily everything's good. No worries. But, um, it just kind of drove it home that the need to, to wear, you know, protective gear. Um, so like in this picture, I have a UPF shirt. Um, I have a, a thing that usually goes around my neck. Um, the gloves are UPF rated as well as the pants. Um, the gloves were a big one. I got sunburn on the top of my hands and I'm a mechanic by trade. So if I can't work with my hands, you know, it's, uh, it's not a good day. So those are a must. Um, and then the pants, the shirts, I mean, most everyone, you can pick them up anywhere. Um, I do have a company uh, that I am sponsored by. It's called Hooked Gear. Um, so shoot me a message. They gave me a coupon code I can share with you guys if you're interested. It's like 15% off. Uh, super nice gear. So shameless plug there. And then uh, the pants are Columbia uh, zip off, the leg zip off. Uh, I've had I have a couple pairs I rotate throughout my trips, just just easy stuff to 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 wear uh, to protect you. If you especially sunscreen, like I don't like messing with that stuff, getting all slimy and nasty. That stuff yeah. I've never gotten sunburnt wearing that stuff. So so we have we have all three levels of sun protection here. So uh, Ed, you're very conscientious and for good reason um, about the sun and the damage it can do to your skin. I will say you're hundred percent right. Um, then the other, the other spectrum is John, uh, who would go out and, what did you say earlier? You'd go out naked. If naked. I, if I, if I could go out naked, I would, but it, it's just, 
I think that's against the wall since 9-11. So yes. Yes, um, since 9-11. <laughs> um no, I mean I should take care of my skin better just because of the scares that it had. It cancer runs strong in my family. But uh I'm gonna say I'm not the brightest crown in the box when it comes to that subject. Put sunscreen on once and then forget about it the rest of the day, go home and look redder than a lobster. Yeah. And then I, I kind of fall somewhere in the middle. So I'm the guy who I never wear sunscreen. Um, it's, well, I should say it's extremely rare. I may use it once a season uh, just on my face. Um, I have pretty dark skin. Maybe it doesn't look like it now. Maybe it does. I actually still have tan lines from the summer um, and I haven't been out, you know, with, with usually a tank top or something is what I fish with uh, shorts and sandals. However, can't see it but on this side of my face i got something that's got to be looked at i I, you know it's i'm damn near 50 i need to stop with this crap so uh told my wife i'm done with that i'm I'm going with performance gear and stuff like that so this year i'm gonna have to make the switch over a little shameless plug with the fat dad fishing hat there i do always wear a hat um i do always wear sunglasses um Actually, I shouldn't say I always bring sunglasses. Sometimes I just realize I've had them off for hours. Um, There's just something about not having sunglasses on that I like. Uh, But I'm going to start switching up. I'm going to start going with that gear. I got to start looking for um, different manufacturers that I like. I want to start getting some of the Fat Dad stuff made in that type of uh, that type of um, material. It's just important. You know, it's uh, something that makes me a little nervous. You know, I got two kids uh, going to college. And uh, if I'm not here, then they're going to have to pay for it themselves. Maybe that's not the worst thing in the world. Um, but I kind of look at it as, you know, still, I'm st- I still got kids, you know, and yeah, I still have a wife. That, so until they wise was, up and leave me, I, I feel I owe them to take care of myself a little bit better than I have in the past. So uh, this yeah, is wait, an important wait, one. Waiting for that biopsy. That was the longest, uh, was it two weeks of my life? So. Not fun. Yeah, not, I, I'm not going to be going through that in a couple of weeks. Um, and and the good thing for me is, I, I don't care what I look like, and but I'm going to have a, a scar on my face, most likely where they remove it, uh, to remind me to stop being a uh, child and just wear hats and and stuff, and maybe buy some sunscreen. I hate sunscreen. I have a concern about the carcinogens in it itself. Um, people can do their own research on that, but. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to do something with that. So um yeah, that's, that's why I switched over to the UPF stuff because you don't have to wear anything under yeah. you know it and it breathes. I mean it's it's not any different. I thought I was gonna not gonna like it because it's you know long sleeve and stuff. You really don't even notice. And then like if you need to wipe your face, you have a usually a clean spot. So yeah, I works. might I might wear a buff and everything for my face uh after the season. I know it looks stupid. Uh, I always thought people look stupid wearing them, but you know what? Maybe I thought they look stupid, but they're actually smart, and I'm I'm the one who's stupid. So again, you all do what you want. Um, that's kind of where I am. Again, John would be John's a naked guy out there. He'll be just waving to you with his American flag behind him. Uh, Ed and I will be the ones <laughs> with the, uh, the 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 performance gear on this season. We're, we're going to have a discussion. <laughs> So I'm, I'm looking sorry. forward. We're going to have sorry. a discussion because we're going to put together some shirts for the tournaments just for fun, right? I mean, we're not serious tournament guys, but we're going to do some Fat Dad, Captain Hanks, Creely Custom shirts. And I know John's going to want short sleeve. And I know Ed and I are going to want long sleeves. So we're going to have to try to figure this out. We'll just get so. long sleeves and cut the sleeves off for John. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm still stuck on the uh, the naked guy with the American flag. I can see. We'll have to. We'll just have to get some temporary tattoos made, and then he can just slap them on. You know, when he goes shirtless for his. Uh, that works. That works. For, for That's fine. I'm going shirtless American flag with Kid Rock in the back playing on the speaker. <laughs> so so okay. So before we we bring this boat back into the dock here, a couple of things, couple a couple of extra things that we didn't talk about. One was brought up earlier, um, and the question is an EPIRB. So an EPIRB, for those that aren't aware, or something similar to an EPIRB that does the same thing, it's going to cost you anywhere from $350 to $600. Usually they come in at right around $499. Um, so that's a, a essentially electronic personal location device. So if you go in the water, it's going to, it's going to turn on, and it's going to send a beacon out, which the Coast Guard will get. doesn't matter where you are. Once that goes off, 
it's hitting satellites and everyone's going to know right where that that EPIRB is. And uh, if they can't identify within a couple of minutes what's sending it and is it false or is it true, they're sending their assets out to look for you. So helicopters will be launched uh, depending on the distance uh, and they're going to start looking. Um, if you're going offshore and you can afford it, there's no reason not to do it. Just keep in mind, they don't last forever either. So you're going to have to replace them every once in a while. Uh, but if you have the money, um, man, it just, just get them. Um, most boat guys have them on their boats. Uh, and EPIRBs, you see it every year. It, it saves lives. It saves, you know, boats. Boats especially, they go down, they go down quick. Um, boats don't usually just languish for forever and sink. They just sink. You know, once they fill with water, it's it's over before they can get a message off. If you're offshore in a kayak and you go over and you lose that kayak, well, now it's just you and your PFD, your radio. And if you're offshore and you're past three miles, you're probably not going to get a direct line to the Coast Guard. Or, you know, you're going to have to have somebody within three miles of you. It's just always better. Uh, so that's my thought on the EPIRB. You guys have any different opinions on it? No, I mean, they're it's good good to have um uh, i mean i don't go offshore so yeah i, I, I wouldn't use it in the back it's just overkill no. it's way too expensive no, um, I mean, everywhere i fish i can if i go overboard or something if the kayak sinks i can swim to shore you know yeah i don't my, my biggest thing is though too if we're we're staying strictly on kayak subject if you yeah. plan to go offshore <clears throat> do not go by yourself absolutely not at least have one or two guys with you. I, I don't think that's the unless you're Rob English. He's nuts. Eh, okay. I've done it. Um, listen, I, if you <laughs> I've done it that three mile, go for it. I'm not going to a reef that's four or five miles off by myself. I mean, I've done it, and I agree. I, I 100% agree. Um, I've been out by myself shooting out Absecan Inlet and chasing Striper. Um, shouldn't do it <laughs> uh, but again if you're going to do it i'm not going to get mad at you just know that you're on your own you're literally on your own and uh if something happens it comes down to you and your uh your ability to uh to get help to you just if your pedal drive breaks and now you have to paddle three or four miles and it's the wrong current you're going to be miles from where you want to be there's that there's that uh the apple watch commercial the guy on the paddle board and the weather turn and he can't get back in and he uses apple watch and they had to send, you know, boats out to get them. Um, it, it happens. So, you know, I, I agree. I wouldn't recommend anybody go offshore. Uh, but that said, I go by myself out in the Raritan, which is pretty much the same as offshore. Delaware Bay is pretty much the same. You get the yeah, same that, conditions. That, that wind yeah. kicks up out in the Delaware Bay for good. It, it, it's like being out in the ocean. Right. And I, I told you, Rich, I told you the story about the, the lightning storm I got caught in offshore. You know, in a, in a in a regular you know powerboat, yeah, I have zero desire. Then that storm came out of nowhere, um, and actually, someone that day in Ocean City trying to get back in died. So, you know, lightning striking fifty yards from the boat. I mean, it was some crazy, crazy stuff. So going offshore it's, for me, it's really cool kayak. until no, you, no way. until it's not. I mean, <laughs> we got we got caught in a thunderstorm, John, with uh, um. What, when we were flounder fishing, I think we made it back like within ten minutes before it really opened up. But it was yeah, just well, like, I mean, it was pouring and there was thunder. Well, I mean, I made it to the beach before it started raining. I was happy, <laughs> you know. There, but there, there is no reason I should be sitting here right now. I don't know why. I don't know what. There's some something. Somebody was watching over. I'm telling you, yeah. that was no no BS, no exaggeration. That was. We, we should have, we should have, the boat should have capsized and we both should, should be dead. So anyway, so, anything else that we missed? <laughs> Fish grippers. So we did touch on that at base a little bit. Uh, something yep. to look into, like you said. Um, one other thing that's not a bad idea because we're on the subject of flipping over and whatnot. Uh, billage pump. is yeah, billage, not a bad have, thing yeah. to have on the boat. Uh, in case you get a crack, Start taking on water. Hey, start pumping that water out until you can get someone to get to you. You might be able to save that kayak before it goes under. So, 
Yeah. And you know, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but if you get water in your, in the hull of your kayak, let's say, let's say you do flip over or you're just taking a lot of waves and your hatch is enclosed or whatever. Um, and water gets in there and it, it starts to get filled, but you don't feel like you're going to sink. You don't feel like you're sinking. The water's not going in anymore. It's just when you're flipped over, you're back in, you are so much less stable and it is so easy to roll a kayak that, that has water in the hull. You need to, you need to, vacate that water you need to get it out of there um i do carry a bilge pump i again i always assume that it's going to be for somebody else um i will say this if you get a bilge pump make sure you get one that has a long enough hose and long enough handle that it can get all the way down to the bottom yeah like that that's long enough it'll hit the bottom and it'll shoot it right over the side so yep, yep. now i actually uh, i'll give you a little one thing that I'm thinking about, I actually am considering putting a electric one in mine. Um, I'm going to have way more battery capacity than I'll ever need, but just kind of like an emergency one for when I put that power system in um, this spring, um, I'm going to have an extra circuit or two. So, cause I'm keeping the fish finder on an entirely different run. Um, so that's going to leave, that's going to leave an extra, an extra uh, connection for me. So I'm thinking about doing the electric, but I'm still going to have the manual one with me at the same time. You know, other people can use that. All right. I, th I think that's going to cover for us. Um, we don't have a, a guest to announce for next week yet. Hoping we are talking to a bunch of people, uh, but man, it's just a tough time of year. You know, the pros are, are this is their time to rest. Um, so it's tough to get some of them to, you know, really want to come on. You got some captains that are, you know, their boats are just getting refitted and they're really focused on that. And then they got to get back out on the water for the rest of TOG and all that. So, uh, again, any ideas, any requests, uh, you know, let me know. Rich at fatthadfishing.com. Put it in the comments. Put it in the chat. Um, I'll go back and, and look through the all this later uh, again. Any parting words, Ed? No. no. Nothing about Captain Hanks. Me. Captain Hanks uh, yeah, Tackle. Check, check it out. Yeah, we um I did end up changing up the website now. So it's Captain Hanks Tackle dot or Cap C A P T. Uh Captain Hanks Tackle dot com. I did uh get that set up and running this week. Um I do have some orders I'm working on. I just getting back to being, you know, somewhat healthy now. So um whoever's waiting, your stuff is, you know, in process. So uh other than that, nothing really. Very good, John. Yeah. Well, so John Hutchinson was in the comments. Uh, yep. Work on his project right now. So that's going to be a pretty sweet looking rod when we're just done with that. Um, going to be looking into the fat that rods here shortly. Um, and I was also approached by someone else the other day, um, possibly doing a rod build with him and then possibly a line as well with him. Not going to say names until we hash out details, but that's another big rod that we could see coming out of the woodworks. I know the name, and I'm already in line for the first one. I <laughs> Nobody told I, me. Well, we'll talk backstage. Um, <laughs> I don't want to talk to you. Fine. Um, honestly, Rich, it's now thinking about the, the two rods. I don't think you would be happy with it. Thinking no, I probably – I, I no. We'll, we'll have to talk about it, but um, – I yeah. definitely would give it a go. The one that you have actually coming to you in a couple of weeks, uh, that one I think is actually an all around rod that suits yeah. your needs more. So, yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to that. Um, another couple of things, uh, John and I, so Ed decided he doesn't want to get COVID again. So he's going to sit out the, uh, the Philadelphia expo on the 18th in Oaks, Pennsylvania. John and I are going to be there on Friday. Um, it's literally 15, 20 minutes from my house. So I might actually swing by again in the weekend at some point. So um, be cool to meet up with some people that are going to the show. So just let us know either in the comments here. You can email me again. Um, you know, you could reach out to John. You know, we're all on Facebook, Instagram, all of that stuff. You can just reach out to us. Let us know. It'd be awesome to meet up with some people and just to say hi. Um, there's going to be a lot of a lot of pretty cool things there. Um some seminars. Um, there's, I mean, it's it's a big show. If you guys have never been to Oaks, it's a uh, deceptively great spot for these things. Uh, it's also hosts like the biggest gun show there um, in, uh, in God in the region um, every year. It's just huge. So 
Uh, hopefully we'll see people there. Other things, um, if you want to support the site uh, or the channel, uh, you can join as a member. There's a link to that below. And then finally, uh, the flounder course is just about ready to go. We just have a couple more lessons to clean up um, and get, get updated and into the site. So the coupon is, uh, for the course for 150 off uh, is is fluke launch that's the coupon code and you can get to that the link i believe is in the description of this video as well it's fatdadfishing.thinkific.com you can get it for 150 dollars off while it's on pre-order once it's up um that that'll go away um and it's you know it's going to be up before the end of this month so really looking forward to that i've i've had some people look at it um and view it uh john did um, some folks that are in pre-order have looked at some things. And also I sent it out to a few quote unquote industry experts in that market and they thought it was awesome. So um, some really good feedback on it and uh, looking forward to getting that out there. And then we're going to jump on to the next one, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, John and I are going to work together on that. Uh, so you guys can just start guessing what it is. Uh, but in the meantime, everybody, thanks for swinging by this week. We'll get an announcement for what next week's topic is as soon as we can get something nailed down. Thanks for checking it out and tight lines.